go. So Lord, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for um, we thank you for the beauty of it. We thank you for putting us in community. God, we believe this is your idea. And we pray that Trinity would continue to be a community that um, lives in your grace and that um, we would get to know one another more and, and share lo your love with one another, encourage each other, be there when there's, there's something we're going through and need encouragement from one another. There's so many ways that the body of Christ, the church, is a, is a blessing to us. And we pray that we would enter in and realize those more and more in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I want to definitely make it so that there's time for conversation too. If there's some things along the way, just, just break in. Would love to either on Zoom or in person, would love to have um, it, you know, it answer some of the things that are on your, is on your mind, or if some, something I say, you know, spurs a, um, a question, please don't hesitate to um, ask. And the, um, what I, what I thought I'd do is give a brief overview of what we're going to be doing these four different um, times. Today, we're going to be talking about a faith to believe, and next week, a faith to pray. Um, what I find is that in, uh, for a lot of churches, Christianity is, it, it just kind of is something here. It's something to believe. And then there's other, other kinds of religions like Eastern religions, like even um, Buddhism or yoga, even that is like a faith to practice. You know what I mean? And I find that a lot of Americans are actually looking for like, are there any habits or practices that actually can help me? You know what I mean? That I can help surrender, can find peace. And actually, Jew, Jewish and Christian spirituality has a lot of practice type aspects too. We just haven't emphasized them for a long time. I think since the enlightenment, we've thought of it just as something to believe in our brains. But really, Christianity is also something to live into um, in, our, in our bodies even and in our, in our days, in our breathing, in our waking and sleeping and our eating you know we a lot of us still have a dinner prayer maybe and that's a part of our practice certainly so this week of faith to believe next week of faith to pray the third the third week we're going to look at faith to uh, belong to and we'll we'll look especially at the um, baptism and communion on on that day these these uh wonderful gifts god gives to help us belong to each other and to the body of christ belong to him and then the last week, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a faith for here and now. And by that, I mean, you know, Trinity, to be a part of this. What, what's it like to be a part of this community? Maybe our history or our, um, uh, you know, our, our vision for what God is calling us to at, at Trinity. So that's a brief overview. And we'll do it about every two weeks. So we'll meet this week, and then we'll meet again on the 21st of February. Then on the 7th of March and the 21st of March. So we have a little bit of time between each, each thing. Um, and I, I have something for you today, and I'll have something for you next week. I don't have it for you on, on the screen, but I can send you a PDF of it or uh, just have it at the church to pick up on Wednesday or next time you're at the church, Lauren would love to just give you. It's a one-page sheet, and it's actually, it's the whole catechism on one sheet. <laughs> a lot of people, when they think of catechism, they think of a long book. And some catechisms are long. Different traditions have different catechisms. Catechism just means teaching. And, um, and so, but this is what's called Luther's small catechism. And it just, it almost in some people say, oh, I, I, I really want to stick more with the Bible. What it actually is, is kind of the Reader's Digest version of the Bible. It just takes uh, pieces important, L Luther called them, um, the chief parts of the Christian faith. And it puts them in one place and it's actually for all ages. I'm over here, we're watching this. Are you there too? <laughs> it's actually for um, for children as much as it is for adults. There's no um, camera. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, good. Is that Stephanie Valencia? I'm so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. Maybe some of your kids are. <laughs> yes, we're here. Sorry, we muted. Now we're muting. You're good. You're good. Um, it's good to have. I said I'm, I'm. I'm looking for feedback, so you're the first one to give it. That's good. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome to watch. Thank you. So we're just going to spend some time today talking a little bit about a faith to believe that that um, faith is something like um, that that helps us to understand the world. Sometimes we think about just understanding faith, but faith actually helps us to understand our lives in a way too. the things in our life, the suffering in our life or the the challenges in our life, also the joys in our life. So faith a faith to understand is the first thing we're going to go through. By the time we get to the end of this, in the last week, I'm going to give you guys a, a form. Just because you go through this class doesn't mean you have to join Trinity as a member and sign your life away for the rest of your life. It's kind of what we call an inquiry course. You know, people that are interested in what would it be like to be baptized, let's say, or to be um, to believe in Jesus or um, to take communion um, or to be a member of Trinity. And so that's why I'm glad the Valencias are here too, because you guys have a couple different age groups and you guys might be interested in, um, in baptism or in communion and Gan's family. I'm not sure about you guys where you're at with baptism and so forth, but um, we'll, we'll be talking about some of those things in the weeks to come. So on the sheet, and um, I, I know I'm sorry you don't have it at home, but um, you can actually find, find it in your Bible too, in Exodus chapter 20 in the Old Testament, um, that is the what what the church also considers scriptures, starting with Genesis um, and then going through Malachi. It's 39 books in what we call the scriptures or the Old Testament. Um, God gave God gave through Moses a um, uh, you know these ten, what they're called ten commandments or ten words. And I wanted to kind of cover just a few of those today because I started to notice in my life that it's, um, do you remember that old book? It was everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Um, and I kind of feel like that in the, in the faith too, that so much of, so much of who God is and who, who we are is actually show, shown to us in, in the 10 commandments. Um, and I'll give you an example. The first one, and you can find this in Exodus chapter 20, if you don't have the, the catechism handout that I have for you. Um, in, Ex, in Exodus chapter 20, it's also the Ten Commandments are also found in Deuteronomy, but let's just, you can just look at Exodus 20. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. But before that, it actually starts with a more important, that's what it says on, uh, on the catechism here, but it starts like this, I am the Lord your God you shall have no other gods. And it starts with the divine name, I am. This is identifying who God is, but it is also making a claim on me and it's making a claim on you. And it's making a claim on your kids. Actually, I think it's making a claim on the entire, the whole world. It's a God who says, I am God and you are mine. Now this is, this is the first Thing we have to actually kind of grapple with, isn't it? Like, do I believe in God? And do I believe that I belong to God? Um, because this was the, this is the original kind of conflict in the Garden of Eden. You remember God made Adam and Eve and he made them knowing that he, he, he made them that he would be their God and that they would be his people. And they had something in them, this rebel, this rebelliousness in them that I don't know about you, but I have in me too. I kind of want to be in charge of my own life. I want to go where I want to go. I want to spend money on what I want to spend money on. I, I, you know, I want to make my own decisions. And when we come into belief in God, there's, we come into this new reality where, where God is saying, actually, I'm the one that your life is to be centered around. Before that, you, we center our lives kind of around ourselves and our own agenda doesn't mean we're not nice people or that we don't do good things or, you know, um, we're not human beings. Of course we are, but, but it, it provides a new center to our life. And so when God's people kind of rejected him, not kind of, they did reject him. Adam and Eve rejected him. And those who came after, I don't know if you remember Adam and Eve, they had kids and um, uh, two of their kids, Cain, and Abel, we see the brokenness even get worse in them. Not only did they reject God, but they also, Cain killed his brother Abel. So murder, you know, all of a sudden there's murder in the second, in the second generation of people. 
And we see all sorts of problems, just a, a flourishing of selfishness really in the world. And you imagine this isn't something that's contained, you know, we, we lived in, a, in Minneapolis for quite a few years and we worked in the worst neighborhood in Minneapolis. Our, our church was on the corner of 19th and Portland and there, there, there had been a truce that was called between two warring gangs and 19, or Portland Avenue was the boundary between that. So there were gunshots fired over our you know, church street and in one, in one year that we lived there, I think there was three people who expired, who breathed their last in our church parking lot, not members of our church, but it was a really, it was kind of like a war zone down there. And at that point, the Minneapolis police, police department said, we just want to contain the bad elements in this neighborhood. We're not going to try to make them better. We're just going to contain them so that they don't get into other, into other neighborhoods. Oh my goodness. You know what? I'm just going to check here. I got I just got an um, email from, how do I make this? How do I make this smaller? Exit full screen. Yeah. Okay. They can watch it. So they can just watch it later maybe if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So they, they had this containment policy. And what, what we see is, be, you know, because of the rebellious heart of people, because of our selfishness, really it can't be contained it just seeps out and it starts to affect neighborhoods it starts to affect other people you know i could be let, let's just say in my own selfishness as a husband or my own selfishness as a father i could think oh why does it bother anybody else but it actually really would bother my wife it would bother my kids it would you know be a bit detrimental to my work um to my life as a neighbor so you can imagine it just kind of rolls out and just as god intended for there to be this world that was just and this world that was righteous, a world that was just hospitable to life, you know, hospitable to babies and hospitable to animals and hospitable to, um, it became an inhospitable place, not a, not a welcome place for people to live. And so God wanted to regulate again. And so he reminds his people, you're like, you know, I'm going to put some boundaries on what is right and wrong. I want to remind you of what a good world would look like. And he begins by starting with relationship, which is where I wanted to start today, really. This relationship that God starts with us saying, I am the Lord, your God. And then just as there's a positive thing about that, I am the Lord, your God, that's positive. He also says, and so that means you can't have other gods before me, including yourself or things that you make or other, you know, of course, other gods. This is one of the things I think each of us have to, grapple with? Do we recognize that God is God and that we are his? And um, some of you might say, of course, I know that. I've known that for a long time. I know that God is God and that I belong to him. And some of you might say, you know what? That kind of is something that I need to struggle with, or it's something I haven't solidified, you know? And I, I just want to pray a prayer right now that for each one of us, we could pray along with and just recognize this reality and it doesn't mean we know everything yet. It doesn't mean we understand everything. It just means we're wanting to start out on this journey of recognizing that God is God and that we belong to him. And so our prayer, and you don't have to pray it out loud, but you could just pray it from your heart. It might sound something like this. God, I recognize that you are God. I see that this world has been made and I believe it was made by you and you made it with care. You made it in a way that was generally hot. You know, it was, it was hospitable for for us to live in it. And I've been a part of making it not that hospitable for my brothers and sisters and for my parents or my kids, for my neighbors. I've done things, I've thought things, I've said things that have brought some damage to this world that you made. And in doing so, I've harmed relationships, including my relationship with you, God. And so I wanna say, I'm sorry for that. I recognize that you are God and that I belong to you. And I pray that you would give me your grace now through Jesus, your forgiveness through Jesus, the one who did keep the law perfectly in my place and then took my punishment for not keeping the law by dying on the cross and by rising from the dead so that I could be yours, not only because you created me, but because you redeemed me, you saved me. 
you made me your own. So I receive you now. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. Well, that's kind of the bottom line. I mean, that's the core of the Christian faith is what we call this grace identity, this new identity that we have, that we recognize God's identity as God, and we recognize our identity as God's children, beloved sons, beloved daughters. When he goes then into what, what a good world looks like in the Ten Commandments, you know, he, he does it in a way that's kind of like a cross, a cru I call it cruciform. Some of the things are in relationship like a, a, a vertical relationship, our relationship with God. So I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You know, that you, you're, you're um, careful about the words that you use, that you don't, um, you know, as it says, misuse the name of the Lord your God. If God is who he says he is, we, want, we don't want to misuse his name or misuse our words in a way that harm our relationship with God or with others. The other thing in relationship with God is that we recognize that he's given us the gift of the Sabbath day to not only hear God's word and respond to it, but also um, he's given us a Sabbath day as a gift really to rest, that there's, there's one day a week. We, you know, we don't just make our worlds, but we enter into the world that God has made and we can rest. We can recognize God is not counting on my productivity to make this world work. You know, he graciously invites me Monday, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday to join him. But on, on the Sabbath day, we can enjoy with him um, what he's made. Then there's these, you know, horizontal, you know, descriptions of the good life, descriptions of a good world. And they have to do, first of all, with our mother and father, honoring our mother and father. This is this is key. If we break any of the other commandments following this, it's also dishonoring our, our father and mother and also not remembering that the Lord is our God. So they have to do with honoring father and mother, not murdering. You can almost see Adam and Eve in honoring your father and mother and then Cain and Abel and not, and not murdering. That we treat covenant like covenant. Covenant are those promises, those relationships of, of promise that we live in. Marriage is, a, is the core relationship of covenant. And so God says, don't commit adultery. That would be breaking the, the covenant that, um, that we make with each other. Don't steal. Give false testimony about our neighbor. That's lying. Don't covet your neighbor's house or the things belonging to your neighbor. These are the, these are the 10 commandments, the 10 words that God has given us that not only start with our new identity, God being our God, we being his. But also then here's what the, here's what the good life um, kind of looks like. Now, if we're honest, we realize, and when Jesus, when Jesus was born and he started teaching in his ministry, he went into the 10 commandments because people were wondering, I wonder if Jesus is going to cancel the 10 commandments. Maybe we don't need the 10 commandments anymore. Jesus came and said, you know, I didn't, I didn't cancel it. In fact, you know, when you hate your brother, that's actually like murder when you and your heart are just wanting his destruction, her destruction, that's, that's like murder. Jesus actually takes the commandments and turns the volume up on them. The, the amazing thing about Jesus is then we realize, in fact, one, I'll just tell a story. There was a rich man that came to Jesus and he said, I think I've kept all the commandments, Jesus. I mean, I know the 10 commandments and I can't, you know, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I've honored my mother and my father. I, uh, I believe that God is God and I belong to him. Um, you know, what are the other ones? Bearing false witness, lying, I don't do that. Um, I think I've kept all the commandments. And Jesus says, good job, man. And then he says, I want you to go and I want you to sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And it says the man walked away sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus knew. Now he doesn't, he doesn't say the same thing to all of us. He says different things to all of us, but he knows in this man that the man actually does have another God. And for this man, it was his money. And so Jesus strikes right at that other God. What's he saying is that, you know, for each one of us, there's something that we kind of cling to. There's something that we don't want to give up. And God says, that's the, that's the doorway I want to come into. Where you're broken, where you're sinful, where you've experienced what we call idolatry. That's where I want to come in and I want to bring my forgiveness so that I can 
liberate you. I can free you from the control those other things have on you. That would be slavery to be a God to anything else. We have a God who actually loves us, and we know that because of because of Jesus. So that's kind of just a quick summary of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the we we call that the law, and the law is is good. The Bible talks about the law being a good thing, um, but we also know that the law has limits. I like to think of it kind of like a doctor. If you go to a doctor, it's a good thing if the doctor knows what your problem is. I went to the doctor this last week because I had this weird thing on my finger and I didn't know what it was. In fact, it just, it was feeling weird and weird. And then it started kind of bleeding and never healed. And so, you know, I thought I better go to the doctor and the doctor knew exactly what it was. The diagnosis was absolutely right on. She did what needed doing on the finger to start making it better. But that's the gospel part. The, the doctor telling me what's wrong is good but it'll only go so far. I actually need the doctor to step in and do something. That's what we call the gospel. So the law, the law correctly diagnoses our problem, but the gospel is the thing that actually applies something to heal. Um, And so this is an important distinction because a lot of churches will just kind of focus on what the doctor says to do or not to do or your problem. And they forget to get to the part that says, but the doctor is here to actually bring healing to your life. That's what we call good news or gospel. Um, And so the Ten Commandments are good. They're like a doctor telling us, you know, what to do and what not to do, but also showing us that we haven't always done what we ought to do. Um, But it's also then it points us beyond itself to Jesus, who is our doctor, who's our physician, who actually gives us um, the healing that we need, the grace, the saving power, the forgiveness that we need. The other thing the doctor gave me was a prescription. And um, the prescription went down, I go to Kaiser. And so it went down to the Kaiser pharmacy. And, you know, it's not enough just to have a prescription, you've got to take it. In fact, I had this other little skin thing on my hand. And she said, Oh, it's still bad is the is the prescription not helping. And I said, I actually never picked up my prescription. And uh, it's not good enough just to have the prescription. You actually need to take it. I suppose most of you recognize that. My skin was so happy when I actually took the prescription, filled it, and actually started applying it. This is the Christian life, constantly applying the prescription that God has given, which is the grace of Jesus. We don't grow out of this. Grace is not just the first day of the Christian life. Grace is every single moment of the Christian life. Forgiveness isn't just at the beginning. It goes until we meet Jesus face to face. Grace goes the whole way through. I'll just leave a little space before I hit just the second point, but any any comments from people or questions from people about this? This is basic for some people, but I, I don't want to just assume that people know know this basic stuff because I think it's so, so, and I don't get tired of hearing about it actually or speaking about it too. So any any questions or comments all right well then i might just hit the second part and then we'll be then we'll be done um yeah the first part is about that identity and the commandments that god gives the second part about a faith to believe has to do, uh, and it gets us to what we call the creed. Creed just means I believe. I was, I heard about a church today. They're a big church in Colorado. And um, they had a really fresh belief statement, you know, um, and actually they put it up on their wall. It, you know, at this church, we believe this kind of like house in houses. Some of your houses has have little cool signs that say at this, at this house, we believe in putting away what you take out flushing the toilet after you're using it. You know, um, at this house, we believe in second chances or at this house, we believe in, you've seen signs like that that are kind of clever that talk about at this house, we believe. That's a creed, really, and no problem. It's good to have a little family creed too. Um, we have one in our bathroom. It's all in Norwegian. I always, I always wish that I had it translated because I don't even know what we believe based on that um, one that's up in our um, bathroom. 
But at this church, it's kind of interesting. They, they, they're an evangelical church, big, gigantic, like Pentecostal church. And they started reading the um, Apostles' Creed, which is an ancient creed, a couple hundred years after the Bible was finished being, you know, brought together, um, the Apostles' Creed and what's called the Nicene Creed. And the church said, you know what? This is better than what we came up with on our own. And they took their own we believe statement from uh, down from on their wall and they put up the Nicene Creed. They put up the Apostles' Creed saying, you know, actually we are going to stand with Christians throughout all of history. Instead of just being our little we believe in our church, even though it was a big church, um, we actually want to take our place with with Catholics and with Orthodox and with Anglicans and Presbyterians and Lutherans and and people before there were splits in the church. And we want to take our place with the whole church and say, we believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. This is um, powerful, I think, actually. I was talking to a, another friend recently, John, um, and he said in his life, he said, so often in my um, individual life, I think about, oh, my faith feels kind of weak today. Or another day, wow, my faith feels kind of strong today. He said, I spend kind of a lot of time thinking about the strength or the weakness of my own, of my own faith. And he said, it's been refreshing when my faith is weak to stand with other Christians, like on Sunday morning or at other times and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and recognize it's just not my faith, but this is the faith that the church believes and teaches and confesses. And it's almost like being able to sit in a chair that holds you up. You know what I mean? That there's this faith that actually holds us. Um, and that is nice because if, if we were just on a roller coaster, you could ask my wife even, I'd be on a roller coaster of faith a lot of times myself, times that I feel very weak in my faith, times I feel strong in my faith. And so um, I, I think the creed is a real helpful thing, especially when we recognize that it's really it's, it's, it's really a scriptural, biblical um, kind of summary of, of our faith. And, you know, along with, with all the other monotheistic religions in the world, with Judaism and um, Islam, there's other monotheistic religions. We believe in God, as it says, but then there gets to be more than just this universal idea of one God to recognizing this one God has actually put on flesh. He's come and walked on our path. He's lived in our neighborhoods. He's experienced betrayal. He's experienced physical hunger and thirst. He's experienced the sadness through the loss of a friend, grief. He's experienced friends denying him. And he's experienced our own death, that God has actually experienced death in Jesus. And this is the particularity, if you will, of our, of our faith. We don't just believe in a general God, but we believe in a God who we know in, in Jesus Christ. Um, and this is going to lead us in the next couple of times we get together, too, about what that looks like. What does it mean? How does this affect our prayer life, for instance? How does this affect our practice life, you know, in, in terms of receiving, for instance, the sacraments, baptism and communion? So God, we, we affirm, of course, God, the Father Almighty in, in, um, in the creed. And then we believe in Jesus. It says, I believe in Jesus, who's God's son and our Lord. And then the third part of the creed is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who actually helps us to believe in Jesus. And in, in Romans, um, it says that, um, that Jesus helps us to, or excuse me, the spirit helps us to say Jesus is Lord. That is, we can't even say or believe the creed apart from the spirit of God's work in our life. So if there is even something beginning in you, or it's already there where you're going, I do believe that God is God and I belong to him. The spirit of God is at work already in your life. The Spirit is moving, speaking, at work in your life. Um, so the Spirit, it says in Romans, helps us to say Jesus is Lord. And I, if you think about that for a second, really in our 
own flesh, our own spirit says, we are Lord, you know, Nathan is Lord, Nathan gets to be in charge, or each one of you in yourselves, you kind of have a natural way of saying, I am in charge of my life, or I am Lord. Um, and the, um, the spirit, we really do need the Holy Spirit to help us to say Jesus is Lord. The other thing in, in Galatians, that's in the New Testament, um, it says that the spirit has been given so that we can pray Abba, that we can know God as more than just the monotheistic God, you know, of the world, but as father. And that is an amazing revelation, I think. That's the re revelation I think I'm most thankful for, actually, is that God is more than just the sovereign ruler. He is that and creator, but he wants to be known in the most intimate terms as Abba or father. Um, the, the word that, um, the word that Paul uses in Galatians is Abba. There's a, um, this is a transition then to, to next time we meet, but because after the 10 commandments and the creed come the Lord's prayer, which starts our father. But um, there's a story I'll just kind of end with uh, someone I really respect um, the Moore family. They have a deep, deep call and care about ad adoption. And they had it arranged. They were going to go to Russia to adopt a, a child from an orphanage. And when they got there, they found out the child had a sibling, which has happened, we've heard before. Um, and so they, you know, it was going to be two for one. They were coming home with two eventually instead of one. And he said when they walked into the orphanage and it was just full of children, he said it was eerie how quiet it was. There was not a word in this big room filled with little children, even babies, not a word, just silent. And they said it was the weirdest experience going in. They asked, why are the children so quiet? And it, it's a sad reason, of course, that they said the reason is because they there's like a there's a um, expiration date on crying. You know, you can only cry for so long. And when you don't get the, any response, you stop or at, in time. And so these children had learned not to cry um, because there was no not enough staff and not enough people to comfort them. Um, that's sad in itself. They got to spend a day or two, I think. They read, he said, we read the books everybody reads. Good, good night, moon, and um, you know, all these other things. They got to knew got to know their new children. I forget the name of the 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 child. It's a Russian name, beautiful name. And um the the after two days with the with the child, um, the husband and wife, Russell and his wife were walking out of the room and when they got they they had to go back to america and then come back to russia to pick up their children but they had to leave and they said he said i'll never forget when we got close to the door we put our hand on the handle and started opening the door and all of a sudden our our son let out a guttural cry um and he russell moore said i'll never read the abba cry passage the same way again because all of a sudden this son, our son knew that he had a father and knew that he had a mother, someone who would listen to them. And this is what, this is what Paul says, the Holy Spirit, the, I'd say the main job of the Holy Spirit, the job description of the Holy Spirit is to convince us that we have a father, to convince us that we have a father who cares about us, who hears our cry, and so in Galatians, Paul says that the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray, Abba, to cry, Abba. And we're going to talk more about that. We'll talk about a way of prayer, not only the Lord's Prayer next week, but um, we have a daily way of praying at Trinity that uh, you, you probably have daily ways of praying too, like at meals, and maybe you um, have a different practice reading. I want to introduce you to, to a way of praying based on, it's a response to what God is saying, a, a response to God's word. And it's been transformational in my prayer life. So I have something for you. If you ever, if you come by to pick up this this week, I have something else to give you too called the daily text. And um, it'll be a gift 
um, to you if you don't have it yet. So any last, any last comments or questions before we close today? Um, it would be nice to maybe just get to know each other a little bit. I'll, let's say our name. I, I hope maybe your, your um, microphone works. If not, that's okay too. My name's Nathan. I have been here at Trinity for uh, 15 years and um, it's my birthday tomorrow. So I'm excited to turn 46 years old. Um, and I'm going to go skiing on, oh, tomorrow. I'm excited to go skiing tomorrow. So, um, so if anybody else wants to, wants to share, Joy, do you mind if we go to you? I don't know if you can see Joy across the courtyard there. My name is Joy. I was actually born here in San Pedro, uh, born here in San Pedro and only lived here for a little bit and everything went to school here, but so glad that God brought me back here. 15 years ago, and I've worked with children and music mostly for the last 15 years. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Kira, you want to share who you are across the... Hi, I'm Kira, and I moved here a year and a little bit ago, um, and I get to work here at Trinity with youth and families. Yeah. <laughs> and Tracy, you want to share a little... Sure. ...who you are and what... I'm uh, Tracy, and um, I've been coming for a few years. <laughs> yeah, you have. <laughs> so it's time that I became a member. And um, I went to high school in, in Torrance, so I've been in California since that time. And before that, I'm from the state of Washington. Oh, you are? I am. From I where? Been, Seattle. Oh, okay. Where in Seattle? Oh, you too. really? Yeah. Well, I was born in White Center. Uh, no way. Oh yes. <laughs> I lived in Berrien. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Well, there you go. And uh, and uh, my parents met at Boeing. Yeah. They met. Um, they were getting ready for some kind of a dance. And they got engaged two weeks later. And oh, got my. married <gasps> six weeks after. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> did you go to a church in? in I did. Um, uh, my mom is Lutheran, but my dad was Presbyterian, oh. and he was a little bit overbearing. Okay. So we were Presbyterians at first, but when I moved Boulevard here, Park Presbyterian? Yes. Was yes, it? Yes. That was a great church. <laughs> so anyway. That's funny. Um, that became a really great church. Yes. I don't know if it was when you were there, but yeah. Well, I was little, yeah. but I, I certainly remember it. That's and, amazing. Uh, so I'm glad, I'm glad to be here. That's amazing. <laughs> we have to talk more about that. We used to, I used to go to Zippy's Burgers in White Center. That was a good burger. I wonder, Gans, do you guys mind introducing yourself? I might put you out this way. I don't. People can't see you very well anyway, but at least they'll maybe hear you guys. I don't hear any audio. If the audio is not working, maybe you could put in chat too and I could <laughs> read it. I'm sorry, I didn't get that worked out beforehand. And Lauren, do you wanna introduce yourself? Oh yes, um, I'm Lauren. I'm a senior in high school. I was born and raised here in San Pedro. And uh, this is my first church, although I went to a Christian school my entire life. Yeah, Lauren, we've known Lauren for a little bit and she's been such a wonderful part of our, we call it a Theta community, which is our young adult community. We have about, um, how many is, it? about 27 or something I think now that are a part of a young adult community that we just really enjoy. And so glad you're here, Lauren. And then some Valencias I see back there. Waving at us. Waving at us. Hi there. How are you? Good morning. Uh, my, my name is Stephanie, and we have Adeo. He's 14. Elias, he's 11. Suvan is 12. And John, I'm not, I won't give you his age. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, uh, yeah, we're, um, we live here in San Pedro, and we also attend uh, Trinity Lutheran. So get, Joy wants to say hi. Hi, boys. I miss you. I miss you. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Um, appreciate it. Sorry for the abrupt entry. No, that was good. And hi, Kathy. I didn't see you earlier. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> and her husband, too. Hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> good. 
did you guys, Kathy, did you guys figure out the sound? Maybe the, um, maybe because the um, headphones are in the jack. I wonder if that was out of the jack. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I mean, Kira's here. She's our DJ for, for Zoom, but I don't know if. Anyway, we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to try to get it figured out before next next time we meet, and we can, uh, can meet you guys then. Can you hear that? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry for that this time. Well, let's let's just uh, close with prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for for the beginning of the commandments where you say, I am the Lord, your God. You want to be in relationship with us. And I thank you most of all for sending us Jesus so that um, even when we are um, and recognize that we've broken commandments, you have a fresh start, a new beginning for us, forgiveness. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who allows us to say, Abba, Father, to know God as our as our, as our maker and as our father. Lord, we pray that we would um, have a good week this week, that we could look to you different, different ways, God, and be recognizing the way you're involved in our life. And we pray that you bring us back in two weeks for the next, for the next class. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jeff, that's right. <laughs> Kathy and Jeff. Well, I, I know another Kathy and Jeff, so that, that should be easy for me to remember. Um, all right. Well, blessings, everybody. I think we are, are good for today. And uh, if you see me in the week, say, Nathan, give me one of those catechism sheets and the daily text. I would love to give those to you. So, all right. Every blessing, friends.